to Master Your Life with Kate McKay, a show exclusively dedicated to uncovering the path to excellence through powerful stories of grit and determination. I am Kate McKay, and I am so glad you joined us. Jason, welcome to the show. I'm really excited you're here. Hey, Kate, it's great to be here. So today's guest is Jason Hartman. And just a little bit about Jason. Jason is the founder and CEO of Empowered Investor. Jason has been involved in several thousand real estate transactions and has owned income properties in 11 states and 17 cities. How cool is that? Empowered Investor helps people achieve the American dream of financial freedom by purchasing income properties in prudent markets nationwide. Jason's Complete Solutions for Real Estate Investors is a comprehensive system providing real estate investors with education, research, resources, and technology to deal with all areas of income, properties, and investment needs. That is so cool. So welcome, Jason. I'm, I'm totally stoked we're going to get on into it today on Master Your Life. Happy to. Let's do it. Let's do it. So you know what I love about uh, what you just reading this bio again was the whole idea that you're providing education, research, resources, and technology. And you know, that really can go into any kind of system, um, really, right? When we think about those four components, what I would love to, to start off with hearing is, Jason, how did you get into real estate? Because this is a place you're deeply passionate about. Yeah, you know, I uh, I grew up poor. I didn't like being poor too much. I, I sort of realized uh, the, the differences in like socioeconomic access and stuff when I was in about ninth grade. I remember I uh, got a subscription to Fortune magazine. I used to uh, look at ads in um, uh, Success magazine, I think it was back in the day, like the old, old version of Success magazine is probably a completely different magazine now. And um, I used to respond to the mail order ads ads in the back and, uh, you know, request more information, send self-addressed envelopes, and I'd get a whole bunch of mail on all these different opportunities and things like that. So I guess it really was before ninth grade, actually. Uh, and um, then uh, when I was 16 years old, I saw an infomercial about real estate, and I went and got the guru's book. I read three whole chapters of it, put it down but my mom picked it up and she read the whole thing and started going to seminars, reading more books. And uh, about two years later, I'm 18, I'm about to graduate from high school. And she says, you know, Jason, there's a, a big seminar this weekend in Anaheim by Disneyland in Southern California where I lived. And uh, why don't you go? And so I went to that and um, and then not knowing what those speakers were talking about and seeing all those speakers over the weekend, I decided I would just get my real estate license so I could learn the basics of investing and not really for real estate sales, but for investing because I wanted to be an investor. I somehow realized that was the best vehicle. And, um, and I, I still believe that wholeheartedly. I think income property is the most historically proven asset class in the entire world. There's just nothing better. It's a, you know, it's a multi-dimensional asset class. It's got really special characteristics that other assets don't have. And um, I started selling real estate part-time while I was going to college. And uh, when I was 20, I bought my first rental property, still living at home and, uh, and having a rental property, which was interesting. And then I bought my own uh, property um, a little later than that. And I kept investing and buying more properties for myself to live in and uh, just uh, grew into a great thing over many years. And you're deeply passionate about it. And what I love about you, Jason, is you have a very positive energy about you and you're very high energy. And I, I admire that greatly. And I'm just curious about that. Is that something that you've always had or is this something that you really have to nurture and stoke? Oh, gosh. You know, I, I mean, like anybody, it, it depends what day you ask, right? <laughs> or, or what you've got going on. But, um, you know, I, I when I was 17 years old, I discovered uh, four great influences. And they were, uh, they were through cassette tapes, good old audio cassette tapes, if, if people remember those. <laughs> and, um, and they were Zig Ziglar, uh, Dennis Flately, Earl Nightingale, Jim Rohn, 
Um, and, uh, and later I discovered more Ogmandino was a huge influence on me as well. And, uh, you know, just all of their teachings, I would listen to their, their tapes over and over and over again. Uh, and it just really changed the whole path of my life. It changed my thinking. Um, I think one of the important things in life is to understand the difference between context and content. And, uh, most most people, I think, try to fix their life, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, by changing the content in their life. And the content would be, you know, sort of maybe similar to if you look at your living room and you rearrange the furniture. And that's great, right? The room's going to look different. It's going to feel different. It's going to be different if you move the sofa around and the coffee table and the chairs and whatever. But um, you're still limited by the room itself, right? The room is the context. And that's the way our lives work. Because our context of what we believe is possible limits our thinking and constrains our thinking to certain results. And if we're able to somehow expand our context, then we can go to a whole nother level of results. And remember, you know, I've trained thousands and thousands of real estate agents over the years because I used to own a traditional real estate company. I used to be on that speaking circuit. I, I'm not anymore. I really teach investors now. But in training um, salespeople, uh, you know, one of the things that's important uh, to grow as a salesperson or any person in any field is to just convince yourself that bigger things are possible. And how do we do that? Well, there are many ways, uh, but one way is we have to see examples of it. And so, you know, if, if you grow up around success and your parents are successful and their friends are successful and your conversations are about big opportunities and growth and possibilities, you're going to be a very different person than if you grow up in the ghetto or the barrio limitation and uh, survival. And, you know, it's just a completely different context, right? Now, I didn't grow up in a rich environment at all. I did not have friends that were wealthy. I did not have connections. I did not have any of that. But what was it helped me what really helped me to expand my context was those big motivational speakers, the big four, I call them, right? And uh, through listening to them, I just started to shift my, my mindset and my context of what I believed was possible. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that is critically important. Uh, in, in terms of the training sales agents, I'll just give you one other example. Um, I remember one of my sales agents uh, who, who had started his career with me years ago. Uh, his name was Mike. And um, he was a go-getter. He was ambitious and wanted to achieve more, but was very conservative and came from a conservative background and, you know, didn't really have any reason to believe big things were possible. So I gave him an assignment. And, um, you know, I, I lived in Irvine in Newport Beach, California, in Southern California. And those are pretty rich areas, right? And one of the assignments I had for Mike is I said, Mike, I want you to go to the Four Seasons Hotel in Newport Beach. And I want you to sit in the lobby. And I want you to just sit there for a couple hours. And I want you to watch people and I want you to study their behavior. I want you to eavesdrop on their conversations. And I want you to just compare those people to the people you're used to, that you, you're used to hanging out with and compare those actions, those mannerisms, those conversations, uh, how they dress, how they act, level of confidence, posture, everything, right? And uh, I want you to just study that, become a student of that behavior. Uh, for a couple of hours. And he did. And he came back to me and told me all of his revelations, right? And there there are many ways we can do this. And now, you know, with the internet, and, you know, of course, before that television, right, we've always had access to this. Uh, and so even if we're not in that environment, and we don't have those contacts, we can create them virtually. And I think that's very important. Uh, another thing about context and um, one of the things I always say on my show, and I'm, I'm not very positive, actually, in many ways. I'm a bit of a complainer, really. <laughs> frankly. But yeah. you're, I guess what I mean is that oftentimes people who are high performers, it is you're at a frequency, a higher frequency. You're not going to go down in the, 
the sewer and relate to the higher frequency people or things or actions that aren't going to add value or where you can add value. And you just actually played it out beautifully. But yeah, let me hear it. What, what, what do you yeah. say? Well, let, me, let me give you the flip side of that, right? So I'm really interested in the subject of sociology and culture that for some reason, it just really, I just have a very big interest in it. I'm also very interested in demographics. And I study that a lot um, because I'm essentially an economist and I teach people about investing and where the market's going and where the economy is going. And that's what I do all the time on my podcast and my YouTube channel and um, in, in my coaching and so forth. And um, I always say on my podcast that the peak of civilization was 1990. And uh, the reason I believe that is because one of the things that really shifted around 1990 was uh, the music. The music had a big change. And, uh, you know, as a student of economics and a teacher of economics, there is a famous quote that I'm not going to get exactly right, uh, but I think it was by like Baron Rothschild. And the Rothschild family is this, you know, insanely rich family that basically created the central banking system around the world. And, uh, you know, they're insanely rich, this family, right? And uh, a lot of conspiracy theories about the Rothschild family and, and so forth. And, you know, I won't go down that rabbit hole. But one of the things I think it was Baron Rothschild who said, let me control the money and I care not who makes the laws. Mm -hmm. And it just shows you how important it is to have control of the value of money through inflation, deflation and, and the printing press, right? And I have a, a corollary to that quote. I say, let me control the music and I care not who controls the money or the laws. And that really shifts the culture. And if you look at this throughout history, of course, look at the way Elvis and the Beatles changed the culture, right? Mm -hmm. And um, the music really shifted. In, in the 80s, it was cool to be a winner. It was cool to be a good citizen. And I, I don't, you know, like, you know, someone's going to say, you know, there'll be a comment obviously below this video, right? And someone will say, well, Jason, what about the movie Wall Street? You know, didn't you see that? That guy was a crook. Yeah, I know, you know, whatever, right? But, but just the general vibe of the culture in the 80s was about improving one's life, right? It was about getting ahead and growing, right? About abundance. And in the 90s, the music changed. Uh, we had uh, Nirvana and Kurt Cobain, and we had, and you know, I'm not saying exactly 1990, but around then, we had rap and hip hop, and all of the lyrics to this music were awful, right? And it changed the culture dramatically, and the clothing changed, the fashion changed. Uh, it was cool to look like an urban gangbanger and to, you know, wear your pants around your knees. And uh, it, it, it was really like this whole stupid, pathetic culture evolved. And it, it, it was spread by MTV. And uh, Viacom that owned MTV that was run by Sumner Redstone uh, really just spread this whole ethic around the world. I mean, you, I've been to 87 countries. I was born in Europe. Um, you know, I've been to some of those 87 countries many times over. And you could just see how like MTV just spread fashion around the planet. It was amazing how, how that just, you, go, you, know, you, could, you could go to every country and like the kids were all dressing the same. You know? mm -hmm. And, and the whole thing really, really changed. And that represents a shift in context because the music is so powerful and so influential. Uh, and, you know, the music changed China. I mean, right. uh, I, I remember uh, I, I have a friend that uh, owns a few companies and lives in China now, and he used to visit China all the time when he lived in Southern California. And, uh, you know, he, he had a company over there and so forth. And he says, you know, when I went to China in the 80s, you could see the shift coming because you'd see, you know, you'd, you'd see a girl tapping her foot to Western music. Right. And you, and you could just see that there's no way they could have maintained the type of communism that they had for, you know, decades before that it was going to shift. And, you know, of course, the Chinese story is well known, um, but uh, it, it, it's just amazing how music changes the world it really is. Yeah. 
Well, you know what I love about that? There's this really awesome book called um, Tribe by Sebastian Younger. If you haven't read that one, I totally recommend, Jason, that that be a good I one. I have not read that book. Oh my gosh, I you're going to love it. I love recommendations. So thank you. Yeah, I'm gonna super put good. Right it's now. short and sweet. And he's such a brilliant writer. And it really is a study on um, the social anthropological uh, examination of the importance of tribe. It's Excellent. so phenomenally good. I loved it. Good. You know what I love about your whole conversation about context, and this is beautiful, is that so much of when you're talking about context is exactly what I do as a coach, which is where are we basing our belief system, right? The content of our belief system using your languaging versus the context, which is what is outside of most likely some false belief systems on your limiting sense of self on seeing yourself as being abundant, as seeing yourself as worthy, as seeing yourself outside of the room of your own conscious understanding. So it's such a beautiful symbolic sense, right? And it's the same way like in our body. Like, yeah, if I lose 20 pounds, you know, these people set these goals. Well, I'm never, even when I was a trainer, I'm, I'm never gonna give you a diet because if I can't change the context to which is what you're holding in your room, that is never going to stick. And it, and it's the same thing that applies to developing a business and even get having a deeper relationship with God, truthfully. It's like, what context are you looking at at your spiritual understanding from your limited human belief? Or are you contextualizing out and seeing really the, the greater power and the glory of what's around us? It's it's unbelievable. So who modeled that for you, Jason? Was your mom in Because well, you mentioned your mom just, earlier. Just, just a moment. Uh, so one thing to, I just want to make sure I make this point. Yes. For anybody listening, you know, like I said earlier, most people try to shift or change the content of life. Yes. Right? So your example, losing 20 pounds, right? That's content initially. Yes. Um, getting a new car, a new job, a new relationship. That's all content. Okay. Um, and content is almost always temporary. Yes. Because in a certain context, certain content will either flourish or it will die. And if you shift context, yeah, you're gonna wear out it the can sofa be <laughs> and live forever. It's what? You're gonna wear out the sofa in the new living room, as you said. Well, all you're doing is moving the sofa around. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It's crazy. I love that. I'm going to use that as image because that's so powerful. So who was then, um, because this is such a, um, do you, did you come out of the box being able to understand that another level? Or was there something that you were like saw or desired, like in that ninth grade, like you knew you wanted more, but was there something contextually that you saw that you're like, I want that? Do you want an honest answer? Yes, it's going to sound very shallow. Please, I need it. You want a hot babe? Here is my shallow answer. In junior high school, uh, I went to an integrated junior high school in Los Angeles. And so they would bus in, uh, you know, people, the kids from the really bad neighborhoods. I lived near school. I walked to school. But interestingly, like the way they were gerrymandering the districts to, you know, with this you know, disastrous social experiment, basically it didn't work. Okay. But you know, that's when integration was like a thing. Okay. The way they were trying to do this somehow, uh, my school district from my, you know, very like lower middle class, uh, area, um, that district also pulled in kids from this really rich area and it had the kids from the really poor areas and they were all mixed together. Okay. And, um, you know, of course it's, it's clicky. Right. And I just always noticed that there was like this group of rich kids that had all the pretty girls and, yeah, and, no you know, I wanted to be in that club <laughs> and I didn't know them. And, right. you know, I wanted to be part of that group. So I ultimately did kind of become part of that group. And, you know, I was a teenager. And so I, you know, became more conscious of how I dressed and how I couldn't afford nice clothes like they had and, you know, uh, all, all that stuff. But I just, I wanted to be in this other better group, 
Yes, right? with, the, with the prettier yeah. girls. And I would say to you, there's nothing shallow, right? Science has shown that even babies are more attracted to features. And you know, one of the things that I've heard, um, just because I'm a neuroscience freak, uh, uh, Andrew Huberman, and he said that people who even have tattoos on their face, for us to recognize them as face is very confusing for the brain because we're looking for eyes, nose, mouth. And when there's yeah. tattoos, it actually messes up our brain and how we view another human, which I find that to be fascinating. It probably messes up those facial recognition cameras where the exactly. big brother is spying on us too. <laughs> oh, I know. Probably. Maybe yeah. that's a piece of it. Oh my gosh. Hey, what so was the book you just did? Was that book recommendation there? Oh, I want to catch it. Oh, Andrew Huberman is um, an incredible Huberman Labs podcast. He's absolutely incredible for the listeners and viewers. Um, okay. Check him out. He brings a regular neuroscience to the everyday people. He's fascinating. So definitely yeah. check him out for sure, for sure. So how do you define, I have just a few more questions for you, but how would you define success, Jason? Well, you know, I would copy uh, Earl Nightingale's definition, which is success is the progressive realization of a worthy ideal. Mm. And uh, it's definitely not about money. Um, money is a side effect. Now, uh, when I was younger, it was about money. I mean, I wanted money. There's no question about it. But um, what you realize is, is money is just a way to keep score. And it's the way to know if you're doing a good job. Hi, this is Kate McKay. If you're interested in booking a strategy call with Kate McKay, please reach out to us at kate at kate-mckay.com. I look forward to speaking to you soon. Basically, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and it's also a way to uh, have resources to open doors, uh, to engage in passion projects and influence culture in the world, right? Uh, so, uh, you know, a good person, you know, I mean, there's another great quote, by the way, and I, I, I love quotes, okay? <laughs> you, um, uh, quotes, and now memes, which is sort of a new version of quotes in the social media era, and song lyrics, they do such a good job of condensing big ideas in small spaces. And so you can just get it in a big idea in a very small package. Right. And so um, there's this other uh, old quote, uh, you know, money is like alcohol. It makes a good person worse and a bad person better. Or wait, no, no, no sorry. That's I got that wrong. <laughs> it makes it makes it it makes a bad person worse and a good person better. Right. So, you know, uh, like bad people, all they do is magnify themselves through money or good people magnify themselves through money, right? So at the heart of it, you've got to be a good ethical person, right? Mm. Uh, but like like that old uh, quote by Mad Madam Shanghai Shek about cause and effect, you know, the, sh the sun shines on the saint and the sinner alike, right? Mm. Uh, and, uh, and that's unfortunate <laughs> that it does, but it does. That's the way yeah. the world works. True. So did you have a mentor in particular? I'm curious about this because, you know, um, I wrote that book, Claim Your Inner Warrior, and I interviewed a lot of men uh, around um, like who was their mentor or role model. Did you have I mean, obviously, you mentioned those grade four, which oftentimes those are when we don't have that in our ho own homes. But was there anyone in particular that you would say, man, they mentored me or helped me see something more? You know, uh, I mean, you have, you have different influences in your life for different things right and of course i had influences like everybody does but the the broad sort of success influences uh were those big four uh motivational speakers yeah. dennis whateley jim Rohn, earl nightingale zig ziglar were, were the f big shifts at age 17. i'm so glad i discovered them that's so great and what about emotionally where was your your greatest um who was that person for you that mostly connected into your inner self? Um, I'm not sure what you're asking. So was there a person that helped you define that sense of being a man in the world, you know, as just moving as the warrior and as the, uh, you know, being able to speak your truth and be honest and, uh, and stand up for other people, which is much of what you do in your work. Yeah. Um, 
you know, I mean, certainly, of course, my mother was a huge influence on me, like like anybody's parent would be. Um, but I also had an influence uh, that was not family. Um, and um, he was a uh, I, I was actually in sixth grade. I was friends uh, with this uh, this other family. I was friends with their daughter and um, uh, this family had two daughters and um uh you know the uh, husband and wife and um i think that the father uh jack uh maybe wanted a son okay so i was sort of his surrogate son and um you know he really uh influenced me quite a bit he was a very ethical person he was a blue collar person um he owned a uh you know like a machine shop uh, he was the owner of it, so you know they had a little bit of money. Uh, but um, but you know he was a, a blue collar guy through and through. And um, you know I, I remember one time I was helping uh, them with their garage sale, and one of the things he said that influenced me quite a bit is we went around to and this is the old days, right? So you'd put up signs on telephone poles that would say garage sale, <laughs> right? I mean imagine doing that today, like that, that wouldn't happen. And you know so we uh, you know I was. Uh, riding on the back of his motorcycle and then he said well now we got to go take down the signs mm. and he always had that really good like very ethical um philosophy like you know you would never just leave the signs up that would be littering you would always clean up after yourself and you would always pick up your mess and you'd always do the right thing and uh, so, you know, there, there were many influences like that, of course. Yeah. How huge is that, though, from a symbolic perspective? You know, it's like pick up your mess, like always do the right thing. Think about the layers that that lesson taught you. It's like, oh, OK. Now so we're so gonna... let's 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 talk about one from television for a minute. Yeah. OK, so uh, I used to love the show 24 with Jack Bauer, right? Kiefer Sutherland. And um, that show was so addictive. You know, I start watching like i remember when a friend uh gave me the dvds and i put them in and it's like oh my gosh i can't go to sleep till four in the morning because you just can't have to watch the next episode i never ever had a tv show like that before right and uh anyway um the the trait i noticed about that character of jack bauer was that he wouldn't do things right but he would do the right thing Mm. And that's the difference. And I think maybe, um, uh, you know, the great management uh, philosopher and teacher, Peter Drucker, who, by the way, if you have not read Peter Drucker's books, oh, absolute brilliance. Okay. Um, and management, everybody's managing something. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if you think you're not a corporate manager, you should still read Peter Drucker because he's, he's absolutely brilliant. And, um, you know, he, he sort of had this philosophy or maybe it was Tom Peters in search of excellence. I'm not sure, but one of them, I think it kind of came from them of, you know, the idea that, um, you know, managers do things right. Leaders do the right thing. Mm. And there's a, a big difference of context and content in that type of thinking and philosophy. Can you expand on that a little bit? In particular, maybe um, just go back to the show 24. He would do, not always do the, say it again, what what that was, because it was beautiful. He, he, he wouldn't do things right. He would violate the policy <laughs> to get the right thing done. And you know who else does that, actually, is the James Bond character. Yes. Right. James Bond is always at odds with his organization, with the British government. Right. Because he'd always take shortcuts and, you know, do the right thing, but <laughs> do it wrong. Right. Right. And the, the, you know, the government bureaucrat wants you to do things right. True that. Rather than do the right thing. Now, look, you know, we all live under governments, thankfully, and, I, you know, I don't love big government at all. I'm very critical of it, but I do love some government, okay? <laughs> and, and, you know, we all have rules of society and laws to follow. And so, you know, don't take that to the extreme, but just use it as a guide guidepost, okay? That's all. I love that. So um, just a couple more questions. So when you're, um, it, what would you want someone to know, um, a younger person to know, or let's just say we're looking at you, you know, 20, 30 years ago, what would you tell that younger version of you, Jason? Well, um, buy more real estate. <laughs> <laughs> 
and love you know, it. Definitely buy and hold more good real estate. Uh, that would have been a hugely winning play. And I did win a lot from it, but I could have won a lot more uh, because uh, it's just such a good asset class. And, uh, you know, it's so funny with uh, real estate investors. Um, you know, they, they always think no matter when anybody invest or buys property, right? They always think it's too expensive. Right, always. But when you look in the rear view mirror, it always looks cheap. And uh, that's one of the things that perspective uh, to, to really, really think about. Um, I have this uh, great poem that I uh, share with uh, my audiences a lot, and it's called The Reluctant Investor, right? And it talks about how everything is so overpriced, all the properties are so overpriced, and it was written in 1977. Mm -hmm. Everybody always thinks that always. at the time they invest, mm -hmm. but you know, like, uh, like emotional wounds, uh, and financial wounds, time heals all wounds. And, uh, and that's the important thing to understand, uh, about investing. So I would certainly have purchased more properties, uh, and, um, uh, you know, probably taken more risk. I've, you know, always been pretty conservative. Um, I don't know, in some ways I'm not that conservative, but in other ways I am, I guess I, you know, like a mixed bag, like anybody, but yeah, yeah. I love that. So what would you say then you, if you were to put, had a billboard in Times Square, <laughs> we're just going to put it <laughs> out there. What would you want that billboard to say? Yeah. These from Jason Hartman. I, I just think, um, you know, maybe it's, um, maybe it's the idea, um, here, here's a movie one that really influenced me. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now this is going to sound dumb at first, but here it is. It's the movie. You ready? Cocktail. <laughs> movie yeah. cocktail with Tom Cruise. Does yeah. anybody remember that movie? It's I an do. Old one. Okay. <laughs> well, in that movie, his business professor had an assignment. And he said to the class, he said, write your obituary. Mm. That's a good assignment. Mm. And really, what do you want your life to mean? Write your obituary long before, hopefully, it will be applicable. <laughs> right. and, and, you know, really, that really, really gives you a chance to reflect on where you're going, why you're doing what you're doing, uh, and things like that. And, um, you know, I, uh, when I was uh, in my late teens, early 20s, I was always a big uh, fan and student of the philosophers. And um, uh, I, I really love philosophy. I remember I used to uh, I, I don't have time to anymore, but I used to read philosophy books and I used to go to uh, B. Dalton bookstores and uh, sit on the stacks of books and, and read philosophy books, you know, because like I couldn't days. afford to buy them, right, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, uh, and anyway, um, you know, one, one branch of philosophy that's interesting that you can learn a lot from, of course, is stoicism, right, and um, there's this stoic saying, which is memento mori, and it means remember your death. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, some people would perceive that as, oh, gosh, this is really morbid. You know, why are you saying this? You know, that's very depressing. But it's not depressing. Look, nobody ever gets out alive. <laughs> you know, none of us are getting out of this alive. And, yeah. uh, and, and so, you know, when you think about your death, you also think about your life, of course. And what did it mean? Like, you know, I think we're really all here to do something meaningful. And uh, that, that meaning isn't make a bunch of money. Okay. Uh, that's never going to be the meaning in and of itself. But the money is a proxy for other meanings. Okay. And it is a scorecard. Uh, and um, I, I think that is a, a legitimate pursuit um, and it will come as a result of, uh, you know, doing something worthwhile. I think that that's a beautiful way um, to summarize that, because I think that we have such a negative connotation and that goes back to the content context image, right? That here we don't want to think of the end or death 
contextually, like actually looking at our lives, looking at the room or the vessel to which we lived our lives. And, and, you know, how do we want to enrich it and, and grow it and perceive it? And who are we inviting in? Right. I think that's the most important piece that we've moved past Maslow's hierarchy of needs, where the hierarchy is at the end, self-actualization. That I think Yeah, many- you know, that's that's interesting you bring that up. Let's talk about Maslow for a moment because yeah. I have a beef with Abraham Maslow. Absolutely. Actually. And I do too. <laughs> I, I don't think that is the highest level, by the way. Um, you know, of course, the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which we've all studied, you know, at the at the bottom of that pyramid, you've got the basics, right? Food, clothing, shelter. And then you move up that uh, pyramid. There's the need for recognition and all of the, all of the you know, acceptance, all of these things, right? And um, I think that Maslow missed two important things in his, in his self-actualization uh, pyramid. One is... Um, and I, I don't know like how to say this in a, sort of the same way, but I think humans have an innate desire, and it's very well documented throughout history, to change their state. Mm-hmm. And uh, they do it in all sorts of ways. They do it through eating food, ingesting drinks. Um, they do it through exercise. They do it through motion. Going on a roller coaster is changing your state dramatically through just motion. Um, you know, they do it through psychedelic drugs. They do it in all sorts of ways. I, I've had Stephen Kotler, the author, on my show a few times, and he wrote a book about it called Catching Fire. And there's a lot written about this now that uh, a lot of these like psychedelic drugs, which, by the way, I'm not into this, but I'd really like to try it, <laughs> frankly. Um, uh, but it's, you know, I just haven't. <laughs> okay. And, um, uh, but I, I do think it's a legitimate study. But I think the general idea of changing your state and um, a rational amount of healthy escapism, I think is actually quite healthy. Yes. Uh, I, I don't think it's a bad thing. Now, I think it's a bad thing when people make it their life. Uh, but I think everybody needs to escape a bit it's like rebooting your phone or rebooting your computer Mm -hmm. every once in a while it needs a reboot and it needs to sort of clear out the cache right that cache memory they call it you know if you're a technical person and that's what you do when you reboot you sort of reset and um i think maslow totally missed that yeah and Uh, and then the other it's so funny i look at it like that he that the pinnacle of self-actualization is actually not the pinnacle. I look at it as contribution as the highest level because it's like Buddha. Buddha said, I'm awake, right? But it didn't necessarily mean, uh, you know, enlightenment or a new level of conscious, uh, unconscious or connection to God or whatever. But I think that self-actualization, we get there by rest, by, you know, maybe psychedelics, but whatever the ways are of to, I'm awake. Oh yeah, that's a good point. Like sleep is changing your state dramatically. 100%. I mean, you know, you, you ever really enjoyed your sleep and had oh. great dreams and you work a lot of things out in your dreams, right? Yes, it's so, yeah. so good. Yes, but I think that, that the big point, I guess that um, is that I think that we're called here, as you were saying earlier, to have an effect on people and money is a beautiful way to en- to use energy and you know as the saying goes you know you can go across town you know in a bus or a mercedes but mercedes is just way more comfortable you know and, yeah. <laughs> you know so i just think that that's kind of funny but sure. yeah so the so other th- the other one maslow let me talk to you about the other one maslow missed real quick Good, go for and it. i think the other one he just totally missed was actualization in god and that's, that's what uh, i know, mean yeah right the, spiritual actualization self-actualization and then boom it's yeah yeah, it's the opening of the higher realm and i'll tell you younger people understand that they have a deeper sense of the higher mind i know you know you know about my son my son understood that there was so much more than what we are just experiencing in this room on the world and so i hook on to his understanding and awareness and conscious understanding as I've lifted out of just self, not only just self-actualization, but a deeper understanding and connection to the higher force of God. So yeah, so that's above self-actualization. I agree. That spiritual actualization. Yeah. I let's call it, Jason. Yeah. <laughs> let's call Maslow. It. I'm telling you, Maslow missed out on two big. Well, things. it was 1940 <laughs> something. We're gonna give him a break. 
<laughs> it was 70 years ago and personal and the whole evolution of consciousness is now a beautiful thing. How much we know about outside. And I love it, Jason. I think you and I got to write a couple articles on the, the relationship between context and consciousness and awareness and understanding. It's really fascinating to me um, how I, I get what you're saying. And I just, I'm applying it to all of my own uh, personal philosophy. So super fun stuff. Is there anything that you'd like to say to our guests and viewers in parting words for us, Jason? Yeah, you know, I think we've pretty much covered uh, all of this uh, stuff really well. Uh, but, um, you know, uh, I like a Zen saying very well, um, which is, to know and not to do is to not yet know. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we encounter a lot of people in our lives and we've all been this person at times too, but hopefully we don't stay that person. And that is the person who kind of knows it all, but they're not practicing it all. And um, you know, the, the, the world rewards the doer. Mm -hmm. uh, there is an innate wisdom just in doing in and of itself, uh, that the action is just innately valuable, even when it's the wrong action. It's so true. Yeah. Taking action. And as the saying goes, our success has been paved in the most beautiful and magnificent failures. And, uh, and as Les Brown says, you know, when life knocks you down, make sure you fall on your back, because if you can look up, you can get up. Jason, <laughs> That's good. Thank you so much for, for sharing and playing with me today. I'm deeply, deeply grateful. He has an insane amount of content. So check him out. All of his contact information will be in the show notes. So um, just in parting, hey, you know, buy real estate, buy early, lean in, be courageous and take action. I'm Kate McKay, and thank you so much for joining me on another episode of Master Your Life with Kate McKay. And until next time, stay in action. Have you picked up your copy of my best-selling book, Claim Your Inner Badass? Available on Amazon now. Go grab your copy 